they start? Thank you. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak at this platform. So as the title suggests, it's, I'm going to talk about epsilon multiplicity and some density functions associated to it. So in part, it'll be a continuation of the previous talk. Uh, so let's define what is uh, epsilon multiplicity. Okay. So this notion, it came up in the works of Kleiman, Ulrich, and Validashi. So what it does is it gives a generalization of the usual Hilbert-Samuel multiplicity. So you, uh, the set setup is as follows. You take any local ring R, take an ideal in there, right? And you look at R mod I power N. That needn't be a finite length, so you apply this local cohomology thing to make it finite length, right? And then you can talk about its length. And then you divide by N power D, multiply by this normalizing factor, uh, D factorial, and then you take the limb so. Uh, so the first question is, why is it a limb soup? Is because in general, we do not know if it exists as a limit or not. Uh, right, so in particular, if I is M primary, this process of taking H naught, it doesn't do anything, right? So you, it recovers the uh, uh, usual Hilbert-Samuel uh, multiplicity. Uh, right. Uh, okay, so now uh, let's see some quick properties of this multiplicity. So the first thing is a non-vanishing result. So it says that uh, the epsilon multiplicity is positive if and only if I has maximal analytic spread. So that is uh, the, the cruel dimension of the fiber cone of I uh, that is equal to the dimension of the ring. So for the most of our talk, we're going to implicitly assume that the ideal I has maximal analytic spread because otherwise the epsilon multiplicity is zero. Uh, the next property it's basically one of the motivations for defining this multiplicity. So it gives a generalization of Ries criteria for detecting integral dependence of ideals. So Ries's theorem says that uh, for a suitably nice ring R, if you have two ideals in primary, one contained inside the other, their integral closures are the same if and only if their Hilbert-Samuel multiplicities coincide. So this basically gives a generalization of that statement through this new invariant. Okay. Now, if you recall the definition of epsilon multiplicity, it's defined in terms of limb soup because in general we do not know if it exists as a limit or not. So the natural question to ask is when does it exist as a limit? So there is this theorem by Kutkowski which says that if you take R to be an analytically unramified ring, meaning the completion has got no nil potents, it's reduced, then the epsilon of I is going to exist as a limit, right? Uh, okay. Now, uh, this example sort of presents the obstruction in working with this multiplicity. So in general, the length function, which is associated uh, to the epsilon multiplicity, didn't have any polynomial behavior. It's partly due to the fact that the saturated Ries algebra, that didn't be Noetherian. That's part of the reason why this happens. In fact, there is an example by Kutkowski, Tai Ha, Srinivasan, and Theodorescu. So they produce an example of an ideal I in a four-dimensional regular local ring whose epsilon multiplicity is irrational. In fact, if you accept 
Nagata's conjecture, then it, at least conjecturally, you can produce an example of an ideal in a three-dimensional regular local ring where uh, you get an irrational epsilon multiplicity. So the question is, what about dimension two? So we will answer the question in after a few slides. So, uh, okay. Right, so now, so this brings us to the first part of our talk. So we're going to understand epsilon multiplicity through the lens of density functions. So this was already um, uh, done by Professor Trivedi in her study of Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicities. We're going to employ a similar approach to study uh, this epsilon multiplicity. Uh, so what exactly do we mean uh, by this density function? So this is part of an ongoing work with Sudeshna and Professor Trivedi. So the setup is as follows. We take the field K to be some perfect field characteristic P, and R is something like a homogeneous coordinate ring of some projective variety, right? And then uh, you also need this um, mild technical condition, that is, you need the depth at the irrelevant ideal to be at least two, because you sort of want to translate this problem to geometry, and you need uh, this condition to do, do that. And then you take any graded ideal, and then you define this kind of function, right? So what this is doing is, maybe I'll use the board. Uh, you look at this bigraded algebra. Right, this is a bigraded algebra. And you're sort of looking at the diagonal components of this bigraded algebra with slope approximately x, right? And then uh, uh, you're, you want to take the uh, limits. The first thing to show is that the limit actually exists. So basically, you, we translate this problem to uh, computing the growth of global sections of some appropriate line bundle, and then we show that the relevant limit exists. So in translating this problem to algebraic geometry, we do not need anything on the field. But when we try to make those estimates, we really use that the field is characteristic P. Uh, right, so then uh, we further show that this function that we have defined g of x, this is actually a continuous function. So you're allowed to integrate over some finite interval. And what you get is if you integrate from zero to some finite integer c, you get precisely this limit, right? Um, so this comes from the, from basically appeal to some theorems from analysis which allow you to interchange the limits and the integration. Okay, so that's the first part. The second part was already discussed in the previous talk by Sudeshna. So, I mean, she probably discussed a more general theorem, but this is what we need. So if you, so here we're looking at the density function for just the adic filtration, sparse of ideal. So here the field is absolutely general. And the heart of the proof is the vector partitions, right? And here also, uh, but here we could say something more. I mean, it's not just any continuous function, it's actually a piecewise polynomial function, right? Now, with this setup, we are ready to define these, uh, this uh, density function for epsilon multiplicity, right? So basically, we want to be in the setup where the previous two theorems work, which is why we all these hypotheses in the beginning. Now, you define this epsilon of x in the following manner. The point is, it will be a continuous almost piecewise continuous function. Point is it's compactly supported. The compact support comes from a theorem of Swanson. So uh, we have that this ideal and this ideal, right, the quotient is of finite length. So this means that eventually all the graded components are same, right? But what Swanson's theorem is telling us is that you can find a linear bound after which the equality happens. So basically, it says that this is true for all m greater than or equal to some c times n. And that c in Swanson's theorem would be uh, the interval of the compact support, zero to c. Um, right. Okay. And of course, if you integrate this density function, um, this is what you would expect, the epsilon multiplicity. So this is uh, the main result of our uh, joint project. But we suspect that 
we can make this uh, theorem characteristic free, meaning k could be any field, I mean not necessarily characteristic p, uh, and we could deal with a finer subsequence, not just powers of p, but rather, I mean, i power n, all integers n. But uh, we have made some progress in the case of polynomial rings, but we do not have the general picture at hand right now. Um, okay, so, uh, I mean, I'm going to skip this. Uh, okay, so what about integral closures and density functions? Now, let's be in the setup where we know that the epsilon density function exists. Then we show that if we have containment of two graded ideals, right, such that they have the same integral closure, then the density functions are actually same for all values of x. But we do not quite have a converse to this statement. Just have one direction. Okay. Now. This brings us to the next part of her talk. So this is an ongoing work with uh, Sai Priya Sudesh and Professor Verma. So basically the objective is to study epsilon multiplicity in dimension two, right? Uh, okay, so this is the statement we have. So it sort of lies at the overlap of the two work that we're doing. So again, but notice the difference. We are not in characteristic P, we are in characteristic zero. So R is basically a homogeneous coordinate ring of some projective curve. But here we're assuming Cohen Macaulay, I mean not normal, so it can have some singularities. Um, we show uh, that the density function, I mean you can define it in an analogous way, right? Uh, we show it's actually a piecewise polynomial. So this is where the dimension two actually helps, uh, right? So. Uh, it's a piecewise polynomial. If you integrate, you get the epsilon multiplicity, and it's in fact a rational number. So why is it rational? It's linked to the fact that if you take the volume of a line bundle on a projective surface, that's a rational number, right? So Zariski's theorem, uh, it's linked to that. Uh, basically, you can represent epsilon multiplicity as volume of some appropriate line bundle minus a term, which is an integer, uh, right? So this is what we have. Now, what about an explicit computation? Uh, okay, but even in this very specific setup, um, I mean, we can have non noetherian uh, saturated Ries algebras. So this goes back to an old example of Ries. So this was probably one of the first instances where uh, he gave an example of a non noetherian symbolic uh, Ries algebra. So you take this, this has come up in previous talks before. So it's basically an elliptic curve Right, so uh, uh, you take a point which is a non-torsion point in the class group, so that's going to have a non-noetherian saturated Ries algebra. And motivated by this example, we uh, wanted to give a computation. So you sort of look at these Fermat curves, right, and then you take these kind of ideals. So basically, these are what's called the fat points, the ideals defining fat points, right, and for such things, we have an explicit formula for uh, this epsilon uh, multiplicity. So this is what we have. So the connection is, I mean, I mean these PIs that sort of correspond to points, right? So you can look at this divisor, AI PI on proj of R, right? And then this ideal sheaf, which is associated to I, this is nothing but OX of minus T. So that's the association, and we take off from there. Um, yeah, so basically we apply some Riemann rock uh, to get there, and yeah, there, there is something there to get it. And um, yeah. Um, okay, so, so uh, I mean, in whatever computations that we have done in the examples of irrational epsilon multiplicity, the density function is always turning out to be a piecewise polynomial. So the points where the polynomial changes, that could be an irrational point, but at least it's a piecewise polynomial in that interval. So, so far we do not have any example where the density function fails to be a piecewise polynomial. In dimension two, we have proven that, but again, I mean, there is a slight catch. We do not know what happens in uh, characteristic P. I mean, we do not have an analog of this theorem in characteristic P. We only know it's a piecewise continuous function, but I mean, what's the nature of the continuous function? We don't, don't 
it's a good place to stop.